elegance can be found in many unexpected places, including a nearly 50-year-old government document. A 1964 law defines wilderness as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. Well, some California residents want part of their state to get this elite title. It's a unique, world-class ecosystem here. And these plants and animals are especially important because they have evolved, they figured out how do you make a living in this tough, tough climate. Our people have come from this area since time immemorial. The silence, you know, you can hear it in your ears. That makes you think about the people who came before. And it also makes you think ahead. You know, this is our responsibility now to protect these places. One desert, many passions. We're probably 10 miles east of Mount Whitney right now, across the Owens Valley, the next set of mountains, which is called the Inyo Range. Just try keeping up with Tom Budlong. At 75, he leaves everyone in his dust on this rugged desert trail. It's uh, very attractive to some people, very scary to some people. He knows this region's plants and animals. This is a juniper, and he's been around longer than a lot of us have. But essentially, as far as the eye can see, a Joshua tree forest. I love them, they're so ugly, they're goofy. I don't know how old those are. He's gotta be at least 50 or 60 years old. And he knows the human remnants along this trail, which was cleared around 1910 to support a nearby silver mine. So there were a lot of very small entrepreneurs who went into this territory and cut down these trees and burned them to make charcoal. And charcoal is what you use to uh, provide the heat for smelting the silver. And you can still find charcoal camps up here. On the days he's not hiking, he's fighting. Yeah, I'm an activist. I go around and bother the people who like to bother the land. He's helped discourage mining companies from digging here. We're on our fifth company. Four companies have come up here and looked and left for one reason or another. Believe it or not, mining regulations here have not changed since a law signed by Ulysses Grant in 1872. And that was appropriate in 1872, and it's uh, inappropriate now. The retired computer expert wants this pristine land protected. It really hasn't changed in a million years. And uh, that, to me, makes it really beautiful candidate wilderness for, for designated wilderness. The bright yellow color, these are the proposed wilderness areas. Um, so these are areas that the California Wilderness Coalition has identified as some of the last wild places in the desert. Um, and are proposing them for wilderness protection. We are actually standing right on the edge of the proposed Avalots Mountains wilderness. Laura Williams is working to pass the California Desert Protection Act. And what our proposal looks to do is to preserve this land as wilderness, which is the strongest kind of designation that our public lands can get. If it becomes law, mining, oil drilling, industrial development of any kind would be prohibited. Camping, hiking, horseback riding, hunting and fishing would all be allowed. 6.7 million visitors come to the desert region each year, and those folks are spending about $230 million a year in the local community. So a lot of people know about that and want to make sure that those people keep coming back and that they have beautiful places to keep coming back to. I think it's important that um, when visitors come to our homeland here, the Valley National Park, land surrounding it, that they need to be appreciative and um, respectful of the land. The determination to protect this land is something Barbara Durham of the Tembisha Shoshone tribe learned from childhood. Some of these areas have cultural sites that we want to um, preserve. These lands need to be protected for us for our future generations. Durham has worked for the National Park Service and for the tribe. She wants to educate visitors and public officials in Washington. Yeah, I just wish I could just gather them all up out of this room and just deposit them right here in the middle of, of our village here in Death Valley and they'll just be frightened just by the sunlight and just by the fresh air and, and, and the solitude and the silence. And uh, you know, it's getting back to mother nature get out of those offices and all the red tape and all the books and just come back, you know, and put your feet in the dirt. Uh, 
Uh, I was 16, I think, when my parents bought China Ranch, and I was just absolutely astounded by it. So you can see the, the, how they really v vary widely in color and taste and, and in texture also. They're just very, they're very interesting trees and fruit, and the fact that they can survive in this really harsh desert climate is, uh, is pretty interesting. Brian Brown's family grows dates, the fruit of the desert. He knows the harsh terrain of the Mojave Desert and its rich history. This is an old campsite, basically living quarters for early American Indians here who would come to this area. They'd probably camp for a few weeks following the game and then they would move on. But the cool thing about them is because it's in such an arid, dry climate, they basically walked away and left this here 5,000 years ago and here it is. I mean, it's, it's a classic, you know, Mojave Desert scenery and panorama with some good cultural stuff on it. Brown took us on a tour from the date farm to a unique desert river. 25 miles of this river is protected by a wild and scenic designation. The California Desert Protection Act would extend that protection to four more miles, upstream of where Brian is standing. We're right on the edge of the hottest, driest place in the Western Hemisphere, and here's this little unknown flowing river, essentially. So as years go by, one of our concerns, as, and as, as more development comes to the Mojave Desert, What's going to happen to this little little river that's wholly dependent upon groundwater flow? From 1905 to 1939, the Tonopah and Tidewater Railroad brought talc, lead, silver, borax, and gold through these parts. And if you look over there where I'm pointing, you can see the remnants of the rail bed with the ties sticking out of it. So the trains would pull up there, they would lower the metal ramps down, and then they would shovel the ore off and slide down the ramps into the train. Decisions being made now will determine what visitors will see here over the next hundred years. So um, I think that without legislation, unfortunately human nature being what it is, these areas will eventually get trashed in some regard or they'll get carved up and, and pieced off uh, in the future. Tom Budlong says being up here is like being dropped into a foreign land where none of the customs or language is familiar can be life transforming because it's so natural and so different. And whether you're religious or not, there's uh, somehow or other something made this, whether it's just plain pure nature or God. The pinion tree is a multitasker. It produces pine nuts, historically a staple food for Native Americans, and the pinion jay, squirrels, bears, and deer and its wood creates a fragrant, long-burning firewood. 